we want to talk about some technical stuff. So Derek and Ethan, if you are ready, I'm going to drop off screen. I'll gather your questions for you and come in at the end with them. If you're ready to go, please take All it right. away. Sounds good. It actually Sounds always good. reminds me like streaming on YouTube and uh, my uh, my youngest, uh, she's soon to be 13, but a couple of years ago, she found out that she's like, wait, you're on YouTube? And she went and found <laughs> one of my videos and was thoroughly unimpressed and has never mentioned it ever again. And so, you know. Here I was thinking you were a celebrity in their eyes. Now. I know. She's like, wait, you're on YouTube. Oh, that's so lame, right? And, you know, in terms of the class, uh, yeah, I don't have any slides in here about uh, the class. I should have wore the proudly sucking at capitalism shirt. <laughs> but we're going to talk about log file analysis and probably more than you really ever wanted to know about how to get data out of log files. And so uh, one of the things that uh, both Ethan and I have noticed in our long many years of looking at log files is it turns into what we call a data addiction. And we are not responsible if you develop any kind of data addiction from this talk. Uh, you're on your own. We'll give you some ideas about how you might be able to deal with that uh, data this, addiction. This warning is really for those who make it all the way to the end, right? Yeah, this that's, warning. That's is the first for, sign. Yeah, if you make it to the end, you might have the same kind of problem that we had. My my, uh, you know, I started a long time ago looking at log files and it, it blossomed into, I ended up getting a data science degree. And so it can go kind of far. But why, yeah, so why? Uh, what were you say? Oh, I just, I just wanted to say, Derek uh, is obviously doing incident response, data science degree, uh, this data science masters, right? Yeah. Um, I do threat hunting at Black Hills, uh, detection engineering, and I really enjoy data engineering as well. So between the two of us, we process a lot of logs and that's kind of the, a lot the of data. inspiration inspiration for this talk. Yeah, I mean, in fact, uh, that's a good segue because log file analysis for me anyway, and for a lot of places ends up broadly becoming uh, data analysis. And so why are we doing this talk? Well, first of all, uh, the community asked for it. Uh, and feedback that we got was you, you all should do content on log file analysis. And so, we're in the rest of the time going to talk about, uh, uh, we'll have some examples, but we're going to talk about kind of um, broad like categories of, of techniques that can be applied to any kind of uh, data analysis, um, you know, situation. And, and really in log files, they make up the foundation, foundation of, you know, incident response. You'll have log files that you'll go after then. You're monitoring and alerting, you're, most of you are probably already aware that, you know, when you feed data into get monitoring and alerting, you feed data into some kind of centralized location. That's sort of the foundation of your security program. So it's, log files are heavily uh, relied on for for, almost, for most things in information security. And as always, there, there are challenges to that. Lots of challenges. So right. uh, if you went to uh, Ethan and I's talk, what did you say it was in 2021? Yeah, November, 2021. Seems like it was a lot longer ago than that, but it wasn't. Um, at the time, we did another log file analysis type of talk uh, looking for needles in a needle stack. And then we kind of had big three sources. It's expanded since then based on, you know, you know, things that have kind of changed in our perception, things that we've been doing. And now I kind of look at it as the, the big four sources. Uh, so you have host-based uh, stuff. So endpoint logs, I think Windows log files or a Linux machine that has, uh, you know, logs going into var log, syslog or secure or something like that. And then network logs, which is always something that's near and dear to our heart, as you will see soon. Uh, then we break out Active Directory and M365 separate because I think they discreetly need to be handled in, in different ways. And then we've got all these other sources. Well, that's that's sort of where a lot of logging challenges come into play, right? Because um, in, in some of these, you may end up not being able to consolidate them. You might have to do some, some more manual analysis. And so where do we get that, the data that we're going to be uh, analyzing? You know, how do you get the data? There's like two, two really broad categories that we look at in, in terms of, uh, you know, acquiring the data. Uh, so the first way, which is probably the most common for folks, is you're going to 
uh, especially if you're coming into an organization that has some level of maturity, there'll be centralized log points that are going or log file collection that goes into uh, something typically called a sim, right? So ideally, you would want all of your logs to go into this centralized collection sim of some sort. There's a lot of different ones out there. It used to be that sims, you know, back in the in the day and, and ancient information security history, also known as 2014, um, that that a lot of organizations that were small and medium sized couldn't really afford uh, sims because traditionally they were you know, a half rack of servers that lived in a data center and cost quarter million dollars to get into the ball game. And you know, it was out of reach for some some uh, places. Now there are pay as you go options, you know, two that I usually recommend to look into if you're looking to consolidate log files would be uh, Sentinel uh, or sorry, log analytics from Microsoft or even Elastic. I like Elastic a lot. Uh, sorry, Troy. Yeah. I like Elastic. <laughs> so yeah, I, I wanted to just kind of cover the cases like, hey, you know, you mentioned I, ideally everything goes to your sim, but why might not, why might that not be the case? So, so some examples would be, so Derek coming from incident response, like I, I made the joke the other day. Um, well, obviously you should be sending uh, memory dumps on a regular basis to your sim, right? But no, obviously that's yeah. not not going to happen. So. Uh, anytime you have an incident, um, you're, you're going to want to go out and get uh, logs uh, and artifacts that are tailored to kind of what what you're investigating and things that probably wouldn't wouldn't be in any uh, centralized yeah. data store. Uh, yeah, there's... Another. Oh, go ahead. Go. Uh, another another thing that could happen is um, maybe cost is is an issue. Um, you can't store absolutely everything. So there's always going to be something that you're not sending to your SIM uh, just for practicality. Uh, and you may find a need for that later and you'll have to go out and grab the grab the logs from the endpoint to the server or whatever and manually analyze those logs or potentially import them into your SIM um, ad hoc. And so another another case, and we find this all the time too, is Sometimes you think you have the logs in your SIM and they're just not being parsed correctly. Um, so, so the original log has kind of gotten discarded from, from your SIM, but you, you still need that information. So you have to go back to the source and, and find it and um, analyze it from there. Yeah, typically what we see with customers is, is cost um to store things and we we face that as well as you're going to find out later i'm not going to spoil it i promise uh cost uh, size scale there's a lots of barriers to centralization that you'll end up facing and and like uh ethan was saying you know when you, a lot of times in an incident response scenario you think of a sim and centralizing log files um is sort of like a wide net of trying to cast uh, you know casting a wide net to try and detect things but often you might have to go do uh, what a you know tactical acquisition to go and make a deeper dive. There'll be log files you're not ingesting that you might want to look at. And so really, those are the two kind of scenarios that we have. We have incident response cases where uh, you might have to you might be getting different data or, or more data than you're typically used to looking at. You might have to manually parse it. And, and you know that kind of goal, there's usually uh, like a pivot point or or something that you'll start with in the log files um, and then you know, move from there. And the goal is usually to answer some kind of question. So that's one grouping of log file analysis that we kind of keep separate in our mind. And then the other thing is going off uh, and looking for bad stuff that we didn't already know about, AKA threat hunting, AKA farting around on the network, um, whatever, whatever you wanna, wanna call it, where you're gonna try and go and take log files as a whole and make some kind of sense out of that. Now, even though th these are two discrete cases, you know, you're really going to be using kind of the same uh, same approaches when you're analyzing uh, analyzing data. And so, this is one of my favorite slides. It seems to end up in a lot of the presentations that I do, <laughs> um, and that's a model on how we detect things. I don't mean just detecting, like for monitoring and alerting, but detecting something in a log file or finding something that you want to, you know, like a, a question of interest. 
And so as we move forward through the slides, uh, keep in mind what this funnel is telling us. So where you basically have all of this raw data that is across your computing environment on various systems, typically in log files, it could be other formats. And then there's, you know, most of it is normally produced. It's being produced on this machine or on, this, on all of your systems on these machines. And then somehow you need to apply some kind of um, uh, techniques to kind of filter down that data and do detection and analysis type work. And it ends up, you know, volume wise, probably being less than 1.5% of the data that you're after when you have a question of interest or you're threat hunting. And then uh, so you'll, you'll apply techniques to do the detection and analysis. We're going to talk about those categories of techniques in a little bit. And then you have what we call it. D domain knowledge. So in data science, domain knowledge is basically your knowledge about the specific domain of information, in this case, information security and log files, your expertise in that domain, you're going to get to a point in, at the end of detection analysis where you have to apply that domain knowledge to get rid of another grouping of data and get to that potentially malicious log entry that you're looking for. The size of your haystack at the beginning matters too. So like we're talking percentages here, but I mean, 0.1% of a billion is still quite a few. Quite a few, right? And so usually the rule of thumb, what I teach in my class when you're doing log analysis is if you do some kind of, uh, you know, filtering or transform or aggregation and you have more than say like a hundred data points to look at as a human, you might want to filter it more. I mean, you probably get away, you know, just gray area. Like you got 200, fine. You could probably manually look through that stuff. But if you have thousands of lines that you, you know, you're looking through manually as a human, it's just not the best. It's not the time efficient way to do it. And I would encourage you to do some further filtering and apply more domain knowledge to get it down uh, to something that can be digested by a human in a reasonable amount of time. And I usually define that reasonable amount of time as, you know, an hour or less, right? I think that, yeah. you know, it, it, you can't, you, you need to be able to kind of, you know, apply these techniques and, and, uh, and, and find that question of interest. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're threat hunting, for instance, you maybe come up with an initial hypothesis and decide, oh, these are probably the things that I'm going to use to, to filter down to events of interest. And you might get to the end of your initial hypothesis and realize, oh, there's still way too much data. There's nothing saying that this can't be applied again, like iterate and do come up with new, uh, new ways to filter the data based on what you're seeing in the results that you do have. Um, use some of the techniques that we're going to talk about in the next couple slides to keep uh, filtering it down until you get to the most interesting. And that's the tip of the funnel there, the potentially malicious. So what, what types of techniques could you use? And I think everyone, that's the, there's probably not anything super new here for anyone because these are just things that you do all the time. Um, without but thinking about it, what, right? Like there's, yeah, things, yeah, you know, but you, you don't even know we call it a name. <laughs> yeah, it's just interesting once you've used um, a bunch of different sims or different technologies, like you do analysis on the command line uh, in a database with SQL, these techniques translate to, to all the different systems. They may be called something different, you might do it a slightly different way, but especially on this slide, the fundamental ones, um, I would say your sim is probably lacking something if it can't do one of these <laughs> or can't do it easily right like right. Well, it's one of those things yeah. where you're like you know i i you know i for those of you who are like that's great you're telling me how to do a transform at the command line but when i'm using uh xyz it's hard to do yes i feel your pain that is yeah, definitely yeah. um yeah yeah again not responsible for the data addiction um at all uh, and so these are things that i use every day right so locating filtering uh like where's the data how can i filter data out what data am i looking for right i'm selecting specific things that will be relevant um to my question of interest in the example that we're going to walk through here in a second i have to show exactly what i do at the command line to you know walk through an example of how i go find something that's potentially bad you know, and, and you might, if you're new at the, uh, the, the Linux command line, you might be thinking that aggregating and, 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 and things like that, that sounds kind of complicated. Yeah, it can be. And so these are sort of like the fundamental techniques that we rely on 
you know, every day. And then we, there's some more techniques that I might not do it every day, but especially in threat hunting these or, or writing DTEX uh, for catching something that the, these are, well, I'd say I probably use these every day too. These could always be fundamental too, but these are more essential type of techniques. Probably my, my I say favorite these are, one is the data stack, right? <laughs> yeah. These are less likely to be just automatically built in, um, but you should be able to take uh, some of the building blocks from the previous pages to, to do these. So like data, you're, you're talking about data stacking is really just, it's a combination of you take all your data, you aggregate it in some way. Um, so you're, you're calculating like sums or counts or, you know, some, some summary statistics and you, you stack it, you sort it, you possibly limit it. Uh, especially if you're doing like long tail, short tail analysis, most frequent occurrence, least frequent occurrence is all kind of same names for the or name, different names for the same thing. Um, the, the whole point is to find what's what's either most common or what's rare based on the type of um, hypothesis you have or thing that you're looking for. And then pivoting is something, especially in incident response, that is like a, a key type of technique, right? You're going to find something, an IP address in one log file, and you might think, man, I really need to see who else in the organization spoke with, you know, communicated with this IP address or domain, or, or maybe I have a hash and I want to go into a different log source and say, I know this hash is malicious. Is it found here too? So that's another one that happens uh, yeah. quite frequently so, in IR. So pivoting, I would say, is more likely to be a, a manual uh, technique in a lot of places. But if you think about it, it's, it's kind of almost the same as joining in like a SQL database. You take two tables and you're, you're pivoting based on the commonalities between them and you're grabbing information from one data set um, and then enriching it with data from another. And it's, it's kind of the same idea. So in, in some cases, uh, especially databases, you would, you'll be able to do this in an automated fashion. And that makes life a lot, a lot easier. And then in some cases with SQL, you're like, wait, is this a left join or right join and enter join? <laughs> wait, so what many join joins. is this? Yeah. It's funny how, you know, sometimes think like, you know, my kid asked me, when am I ever going to use this in life? Mostly about algebra and geometry, right? And uh, I, you know, I, I sometimes think the same, thought the same thing of like in computer science class, right? Like, wait, when am I ever going to use this join? Oh, wait. There you go, all the time, so. <laughs> all right, so windowing is, um, I guess I don't, it's it's definitely a thing in SQL and, and databases. I don't know how many other tools could do something similar. I'm sure there are equivalents because it's just, it's been so useful. And it's really, so back to the previous slide, one of the options, one of the fundamental techniques was um, just transforming uh, data and, and aggregating. So the uh, windowing is kind of a combination of the two. So you're taking, um, you're, you're not reducing the number of results that you end up with. You are taking and creating a new field for every result. Um, but how you calculate that field is, so in transforming, you'd calculate it based on the other information in that same, same event, same row, same line. Um, but in the case of windowing, you're calculating that using an aggregate function, using some other data, uh, so usually like a, especially if you're working with time series data, you're doing a window of you know, yeah, hey, that's 30 days before time series, yeah, th like you're moving 30, 30 days before to now, I want to, I want to know what the average was and put it in this. So again, you're not, you're not taking the whole data set and creating an average you're taking, you, you can possibly like split it up to um, say, the average number of uh, connections to this, the domain that's in the current row that we're processing over the last 30 days, so, something like that. So that's, it's kind of a more advanced concept, but it's just surprising how common and um, useful it's, it's become. And, and again, some of these things you probably have in your sim and you don't really realize or you haven't realized at this point that it's 
like something that is a like if you take a step back and look at it like a, a, a technique that could be applied you know even at the command line in some cases and that's what we're going to talk about now is the command line now Specifically, I'm talking about the Linux command line. And for illustration of, you know, we think back to that data funnel. And there'll be a couple of times where we say, think back to that data funnel, right? So that this example kind of walks through some log file analysis uh, of, of um, a, uh, you know, of, of some uh, Zeek data and kind of building those pipelines along, you know, down that data file. But again, most people start at the Linux command line, at least in my opinion, to do some of these log file parsings. Now that's not to say that you can't use PowerShell as well. I just happen to think that the Linux command line is easier to kind of get started with and kind of think through because it processes data in, in a stream of text. And in fact, you have to use text. Your log files have to be text-based um, in, in most circumstances uh, for command line at, at you know for Linux. It's not to say that PowerShell is a bad choice. It certainly is. I, I you know, I, I think it's a great way to parse log files. I just really suck at it. So it's not my go-to dance move. But PowerShell is different in that it typically handles like the, the text as an object. And I just, I've never stepped out of my comfort zone to learn the PowerShell. It's, it's funny that you keep mentioning PowerShell and you even mentioned the object nature. Because uh, what... I think the strength that makes the Linux command line easier to work your head around and learn um, is kind of is one of the shortcomings we point out later. And having objects be a first class citizen and native um, to the command line in, in as it is in PowerShell is kind of one of the ways to overcome the, that, but it does introduce complexity. So deep rabbit hole for sure. And so some of the basic commands that I use all the time, uh, cat to uh, concatenate uh, data out uh, to uh, the standard out, or as you'll see with Zeek, uh, since they're gzip compressed, uh, Linux has a tool for everything. You can use zcat to, um, to, to, to de decompress the gzip file. grep, which is going to be, so we're talking about filtering earlier, so you'll search for with grep, or in the case of gzip, you could use zgrep. There's always another command in Linux. Um, there's always a different way to do it in Linux. Yeah. And I'm going to point that out got again their own in favorite a second. There's, yeah, and, there's a thing called the uh, bash gulf where you try to do the the thing in the fewest amount of characters as possible. Yeah, right. It's just, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, one, another tool I use very frequently, cut, um, to cut out uh, in delimited files, like comma delimited or tab delimited files. Uh, you can filter uh, uh, further down specific columns of data, so to speak. Um, so you can, you know, get specific things out. Zeek cut is these, uh, the, if you've ever used Zeek, is specific to Zeek and it'll pull out uh, data based on the header or the column of the data. And then, you know, for transforms, I like TR. There's definitely other ways to do it, said, awk. Um, but uh, TR is pretty user friendly. And so the examples I'm getting ready to show, um, you know, is there a more elegant and efficient way to do it? Absolutely. So when you make the comment in the chat, well, you could have done it this way. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, and, and so we're really what we're doing is we're illustrating a perfect, like illustrating following that data funnel, like how you go about building the command line out. Uh, and then we'll show you the more efficient way to do it or a, another efficient way to do it. And I, I made an analogy the other day, and I'm sorry if it's not exactly accurate. And, and Ethan, stop me if you don't want to hear the analogy. But I looked at it kind of like calculus and pre-calculus, right? So I think that, you know, this example is sort of the pre-calculus to the calculus where, you know, you need to find the area under the curve in pre-calculus. So you draw a bunch of rectangles under the curve and calculate the area using geometry. And then you have these little weird triangles with the curve still there. You have to calculate that area. And you're sitting there doing this in pre-calculus going, man, this is really tedious. I hate this. And then you get to calculus and they're like, hey, let me show you about this derivative. And what about this integral? And you're like, oh man, you could have just led with that, right? But then you wouldn't know the underlying, you wouldn't know the hard way and you have to know the hard way, right? You have to know the long way. And so in this example, 
um, what we're going to do is an incident response example. So uh, we have a bad known domain. Uh, so two, two, domain, two domains that we suspect are bad. And what we want to do, what management is asking, is they want to know, was any data exfiltrated? Because we're sure that command and control was established to these two cloud front domains. And so can you tell me, was their uh, data exfiltrated? So what we're going to do, start with that domain. We're going to filter the DNS logs and look for the IP address that has the, you know, the answers to that domain lookup. And then we're going to pivot over to the connection log and find bytes sent and received. And then once we get to the end of that, Ethan's going to show an easier way to do it. And so you can see in my first command here, I start out with catting out all the data. So we have all that normally produced data in the SSL log in, in, in Zeek. And I then use cut or Zeek cut to just cut out the server name, sort it, sort it unique, or sort it, count it unique, count the unique ones, and then sort it uh, descending. So this is a data stack of the domains that were in this specific log file and how frequently they occurred. And so, Wait, then, so you're telling me. You tell me if this is an example of data stacking, right? Here. Exactly. This is an example. This is a data stack example at the command line of the server name for every SSL connection in the Zeek log, um, in the SSL Zeek log for that timestamp. And so what we do is we take those, uh, those domains, these cloud front domains here separated by a pipe, and uh, we're going to pivot to the DNS log entry, and we're going to look for both the query and the answer fields that contain these two domains. And so we find that there are some domains that are associated with this. Now, you know, back to that you know comment about manual kind of analysis. Certainly, you could manually copy and paste this and put it in a text file and get the control characters out, get the dashes out, that kind of stuff totally is valid. I do that stuff a lot. Um, but what if you had thousands of entries that were all interspersed? I mean, it might, it might be a little bit better to do it at the command line to get it into a format that we, that we like, that we can use to search. Now, this ends up getting ugly pretty quick, right? So we're doing the same kind of thing. We're looking at the DNS logs, we're getting the answers out, we're looking at them. Um, and so if you, if you look at the, 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 the screenshot before, it's in this block of text right here, now it's separated out by pipe characters, which I need to do a further search. And so we go through, we cut out data, we do some transforms. This is kind of ugly. We're taking out new lines, we're putting in new lines, we're going to sort and unique, we're going to transform again. And we end up with the ability to search through the connection log. And so the output of that previous command uh, gets put in here where we have the uh, IP addresses that were associated with the domain lookups. Now we wanna know if those IP addresses in the connection log for Zeek had data that was exfiltrated. Now, usually what I do at this point is I ask the class questions um, about this, but you know, since this is a webinar and you can't answer me, um, then I, I'll just go ahead and say that this is definitely beaconing activity. This is in bytes. So for every request, we have you know uh, six thousand bytes that was received or, or sent to, to the eight hundred byte uh, request. We have one that's a little bigger, that's two hundred and seventy k. But normally, what I ask is, does this look like data exfiltration? And the answer is no. This looks like beaking activity just based on the size. How do I know that? That's where that domain knowledge comes into play. I've seen it and I know. And so that's, uh, you know, my answer is no, this was beacon. I also did the lab, so I, I, I knew that. But um, And so how can you slice and dice logs in a more efficient way? So actually, can you go back a couple of slides? Yes. I just want to do some unscripted, uh, so give some people some tips. Uh, next, I thought the whole thing slide. was unscripted here. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next, next many slide. slides. Which one? Uh, the one forward. No, wrong way. This one. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So when you get command line uh, looking like this, pretty hairy. So, okay. First of all, back up. I think we we kind of forgot to talk about for those unfamiliar with the the Linux command line. It's it's a pipeline. So you start with data over here, and then you, like you're literally using the pipe character, and it gets passed to the next command, and then that command does stuff to it. 
you do pipe character and then pass to the next one and on and on and on. So, so he's starting out with data and it's getting passed along the shell pipeline here. When you get something really long like this, uh, you might know what data is going into your pipeline and you can see what data is coming out and it might not look like what you want it to look like. You're playing a game of telephone with yourself and it's just not working. So some uh, tips for developing this type of thing is, I mean, obviously do it a little bit at a time, build your pipeline up. Like you don't start with this. You, you start one step at a time. And if you're debugging something like this or maybe working on, you know, someone else's command, like Derek gives you this command and it doesn't quite work for you and you're wondering why. Uh, so in between the pipes, especially if you're working with a lot of data, head is, is a very useful command because uh, it limits the number of results you get to 10. And so yeah. you just get kind of a sample of what you're doing. And it doesn't take nearly as long as if you're waiting three minutes or whatever for, for your command to finish on all your data and only to find out it's wrong. Um, the, Sounds like yeah, the other one. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, the, the other one, I guess, is just back to, hey, build it up a little bit at a time. So take yeah. out take out pieces from the end, make sure the data is looking like what you expect, what you want it to do at every single step before you move on. And that's actually a, that's a really good point. And that's why I build things out like this. I do know that I don't have to cat and then cut or cat and then grep. But I just the way I build it out in my mind and sometimes like Ethan was saying, sometimes I'll find a command that's gnarly that someone else did and it doesn't work. And I'll just start taking things off the end. And I like to look at it as that kind of pipeline. It's just how I do it. Does it mean it's right or wrong? It's just a way. Yeah. So threat hunting toolkit. Um, it's a, you can think about it as a, a toolkit, like a, a grab bag, um, like a work, a worker's toolbox that has a bunch of stuff in it already. Uh, really it's, it's just, um, a neat way to package all those tools together in a, in a familiar environment. So you, when you are in the threat hunting toolkit, you're in a shell, you're in Linux. It's all the same stuff that Derek talked about applies. You could use those exact same commands in the threat hunting toolkit where THT helps is I would, as we talked about at the beginning, we have both done a lot of log analysis and I was finding common patterns that I was doing over and over and over again. And it was just, I got tired of typing it, honestly. Tired of typing, <laughs> typing, sort, yeah. pipe, yeah, yeah. sort, yeah, or unique dash C, right. pipe, sort, so NR, what, uh, sort. Yeah. What started out as um, a couple like helpful aliases ended up being this whole toolkit of scripts and other other tools, um, like maybe no. hey, Linux comes Linux yeah. comes with, you know, your hammer, your, your screwdriver, maybe a saw, but just basic tools. Um, I find that there's there's a lot of power tools out there that sure are helpful. Uh, so instead of having at every new job site I was at having to go buy a new power tool, um, I just you know brought, bring them with me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so some of the benefits um, right off the bat, like filter is the the best one that I always start with. So like I said, you can this this might look weird um, because it's tools that are specific in THD, but you can use the exact same tools you were using before, just throw in something new that, that will help. So the advice I give to people starting out with THD is learn what filter is used for. And it's really a combination of find and grep, um, but the grep it's using uses multiple cores. Uh, to You could do that with with uh, vanilla grep, but that it involves grep. some uh, it, it's it's actually you grep on the back end. No, so yeah, it, it'll, it'll process files in parallel. I wonder how uh, many greps there actually are in Linux. There's there's quite a there's few. There's quite a few. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, these aren't these aren't built in the ones that we're talking about, but um z so grep will only search a single file, sing use a single core. So if you ever look at htop or, you know, the your process utilization, your CPU utilization while you're running a grep, you'll see like one core is pegged and you got all these other 7 8 15 whatever cores sitting there not doing anything. Filter will help solve that like it will it will use all the cores for all the searching and it it scales it's it's a lot faster and it's just it's it's a lot easier to type um in a lot of cases so yeah so we're doing the exact same thing here it's just it's shorter hey we're taking all the ssl logs we are uh pulling out the server name using a tool called chop which is 
just a way instead of, uh, so zip cut is great and I would use that, except it doesn't work with JSON logs. Um, or if you're working with not Zeek logs, just TSV log, uh, CSV logs, or you know wh whatever, um, Zeek cut is very specific to Zeek logs. Uh, Chop is more generic. It can handle Zeek logs, um, generic TSV logs, CSV logs, JSON logs, et cetera. And then what Derek's doing on the end, sort, unique, sort, do it all the time. It's stack counting, right? Uh, and one of the terms I, I mentioned earlier is most frequent occurrence. And so that, that's what the last tool we see here is MFO, so most frequent occurrence. And then you can optionally give it um, a number to just, hey, give me the first the first 10. Instead of doing pipe head, right head dash yep. in 10, right? So. Yep. <laughs> All right, so moving on, just again, taking the examples that we've shown before and showing you different ways to do it using some of the, the convenience features in THD. So instead of, uh, in, instead of crafting, let's see, what are we doing here? We're getting those same IPs out. Um, so, so we're filtering the DNS logs and we're looking for those two domains that we pulled out in the last example. And then we're again, pulling out query and answers. And, and so, so Derek actually- data to a file. Yeah, Derek actually didn't do this, um, but another way to just kind of condense the, the logs, he could have piped to sort and unique just to get all the unique lines. And there weren't that many to begin with, but if yes. you have a lot of log, a, a lot of lines and there's a lot of duplicates, you know, you might want to just show me the different ones, show me the ones that are unique. So well, that's what the distinct script will do. And it's, it's the same as oh, piping for, wow, to, to sort and unique, but go. No, I was going to say that definitely I do stage data for sure, especially like when yeah. you get into situations where your, your command takes uh, a bit to finish. Um, it is annoying to run a command that takes five minutes to run and then yeah. you get the output and you're like, that is just not quite right. And then, yep. yeah, so staging the data can be useful for sure. So I want to point out the a, a, a trick in the last uh, command, the last line in this slide. So filter dash P IPv4. So filter I, I mentioned is kind of a combination of find and grep, um, but it has some other neat features in like, it's got some preset regexes that I was using all the time. So it's got a regex that detects IPv4 and anyone who knows regexes is they're never going to be perfect, but it, it does the job um, pretty well. And then the dash O flag is, Hey, just give me the matches. And it's going to print them out one one line at a time. So basically, taking Derek's big long cut, trans, uh, translate, translate, whatever, uh, and and condensing it into that. Like, hey, give me give me all the unique IP ad ad addresses. All right. So next slide again. Just same same kind of thing. Uh, we we wrote those IPs to a, a staging file, and instead of having them on the command line, you could you could combine command lines. We could we could do all of this all all of these slides into a single one liner. But but then uh, it'd be why, hard why to do talk, that to yourself? Yeah, it would be hard to talk through like the, the thing, right? So this is why I say yours is the integral to my pre-calculus, right? Like <laughs> it's just a more elegant solution and, and way to get to the same kind of answer. And as you yep. do more and more data analysis, yeah, having shortcuts is very beneficial All and right, then so this you can is, actually do even more yeah this is taking it one step further um so this is one of those power tools that we mentioned so uh zq it's it's the z project um i'll post a link in discord right now so basically has a domain specific language where you can do things like aggregates. Um, there's another one called Miller, which I use quite a bit too. The, the cool thing about ZQ is it also understands uh, Zeek uh, TSV files, but it can also read JSON, CSV, TSV, whatever. And yeah, so this, you, you could do, as Derek mentioned, you could do the same thing a bunch of different ways. We, we could use awk for this. We could use an awk script. Um, there's other tools called, like data mash would do this. There's, there's a lot, a lot of different ways. Just this is one way you can do it and it's included in, in THT. So yeah, basically taking, taking all those, um, individual, 
uh, byte results, and we're summing them up based on the source and destination IP. So we're getting uh, every, every unique source IP, every unique destination IP, and then the sum of the bytes uh, for sent and received. So that you can see, so, so Derek's uh, point, when you see them individually, you can kind of look and see patterns and say, oh, hey, this, this looks like beaconing. This doesn't look like, you know, there's a lot of data being exfiltrated. Um, but seeing a summary is also great too, knowing like, okay, uh, overall, mm. you know, what is it? Six, 690K data was, K. Was, yeah. uh, was actually, that was what downloaded. the responses were. So even smaller yeah. than the upload size. Yeah. So this does not look like the yeah. shape of data exfiltration, right? Right. Yeah. And we'll we'll see another uh poss yeah, we'll we'll see another um useful metric for, for data expo later. So you know, some of some of the weaknesses of the command line. I love the command line, but you know, it, it's it's there, it's really powerful. Uh, you can build out very sophisticated commands. But it has limitations for sure, and and probably the biggest one is, in my opinion, is the uh, the operating on binary type formats, right? Like it has to be text based, which which is okay in most scenarios until it's not, right? Um, like uh, limited visuals, it's hard to do. Even if you do uh, uh, visualization at the command line, your mileage may vary and what that actually looks like. And human beings do well at, at, at looking at graphs and, and, and pointing out or and being able to look at patterns in a condensed kind of way. And then there's no real structured data. It's all, like we said, just this text and strings. And there's another problem that is on this slide that kind of, it's not a command line problem, for the rest of the uh, the, the the talk, uh, we're going to talk about how we saw a, some really big problems at, at Black Hills in terms of our our, our SOC, mm -hmm. um, and that is the amount of data that is coming in. So in our SOC uh, at, at at BHIS, we put in network sensors at all of our, our our customer sites, and so which is a great thing. I don't know other SOCs that do that. There may be, but there's, there's lots of reasons why not. And Ethan, I think the biggest reason is how much data you actually end up with. So what, what is this, a two week uh, uh, calculation? Yeah, um, how yeah much? it's, yeah, it's roughly two weeks of Z clocks coming in. Yeah, so um, we have uh, 42 we sensors at the moment, I think, give or take. Um, and over that uh, uh, 15 terabytes of, of Zeek data over a two week period. And well, yeah, that's tough to do at the command line. Um, and so, and then on top of that, you know, separation of organizations, normalizing log files, these are all things that you kind of have to graduate to the next uh, step in your data addiction to kind of, uh, kind of uh, get out of, right? And so how do you solve some of those problems? And that, those are hard problems to solve. And you start with the format. All right, so up until now, we talked about kind of the strengths of CLI being, hey, everything everything is a string and it's also a weakness. <laughs> but the text-based formats that we're all kind of familiar with, CSV, TSV, JSON, XML, it, syslog. What, what, what was it that you called syslog, Derek? Human readable log format? Human readable. Uh, same yeah. thing with like ASA logs. They're a pain in the butt, right? And the reason yeah. why, like with syslog, is there there's some, uh, what do you want to call them, like mutable fields or whatever? They get basically the same every time, like time, mm -hmm. date, log type, area, you know, facility, that kind of stuff. And then you usually have a message that is a variable length message after mm -hmm. that. And I find that and same thing with ASA logs and uh, there have been other log formats. It, it's easy to read as a human and it is difficult to programmatically parse at the command line. All right, so we kind of realized that this, there, there's, there might be a better way. Um, C, CSV is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Um, basically anything that you have if it's in a different format, there's a converter written to convert it to CSV, but there's problems parsing CSVs. They're not particularly storage efficient. They're definitely not query efficient. You got to go through the whole the whole shebang um, if you want to if you want to search it. So there's a there's a format out there that maybe isn't as well known. It's called Parquet, and it is pretty. It, it's it's like the 
it, it's a I would I want to say it's ubiquitous in data the, the data science field because um, pretty much every tool that is a data science tool is going to understand Parquet. So you can think of it like the CSV of data science, <laughs> although CSV is the CSV like of data science as well. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, so so Parquet is a efficient. It, it's a way more efficient storage format. Uh, it's an efficient query format because of the way that the data is laid out. And it we we kind of realized this. I I don't know this for a fact, but Derek's like, hey, there's some Parquet flooring. I wonder if that's where they got the name. I was like, it has no, to be. it's it can't it can't be related to flooring. And then I looked at a picture. I'm like, oh, huh. That kind of illustrates how the data is laid out in the format. So that probably is how I got the it's, name. It's, it's either that it's a, or it's the butter from the eighties and I don't get the, get it then. Yeah, it's yeah. a, so, so Parquet is a hybrid columnar format. I think they, they call it, but basically it, there's, it's got rows um, or it's got chunks of columns, I'll, we'll say. So, so it's stored like the columns. So same, like all the timestamps are stored together in, in the file. And then all the IPs are stored together in the file. Um, but in chunks. So they're like maybe a chunk of a hundred thousand is stored and then and then you get the rest of the columns. And then another chunk of hundred thousand uh, timestamps. So so like yeah, the alternating rows and column chunks is a is a pretty good uh, uh analogy there. So anyway, um the the little tiny graphic there. So if you remember the last one was 15 terabytes. Um so I've I've been making an effort to convert that same the, the, that same data to Parquet format and Parquet supports compression as well. Um, so, so after the conversion, it was down to four, four terabytes, which is still a lot of data, but it's a lot more efficient um, query, uh, query, query format. The third reduction, more than a third. Yeah. Oh, the other thing about Parquet, sorry. Uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know which, which slide would be best to talk about it on, but it we need to move forward. We have 11 minutes left. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so, so it has like kind of summaries or almost uh, database like indexes. Not, not, it's not a full database, um, but, it, but it's got, hey, this, this chunk, here was the max value, here's the min value. So then if something goes and reads the Parquet file, like here's a bunch of things that support Parquet, maybe you've heard of some of them, like TAN does. And some of these might be more unfamiliar. Um, they can go and say, look at your query and look at the metadata in the Parquet file and say, oh, these chunks, they, I've got the min and max. It doesn't overlap with what the query wants. So I'm just going to not read those at all. So it can go and like uh, strategically pick out from the file you know, data that could be relevant. So it's searching a, a lot smaller subset, plus it's more efficiently stored and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Uh, so we we find that Parquet is really great combined with S3 storage. So I, there was some discussion in Discord earlier about um, SIMs being too expensive, and uh, another point of hey, SIMs are actually more affordable than ever before. And I, I agree with both of those. Honestly, I, th I think the key piece is yeah, SIMs are more affordable, but that just means we can shove more data in them, and oh. we're not running out of data. Yeah, so the, I mean, <laughs> it is that way for sure. But I mean, it's always it, it, it it's cost benefit analysis, right? We have 15 terabytes every two weeks of Z clogs. We could shove that in the sim and pay for storage twice. All right. I mean, pretty much. Yeah. All right. So once you have your data on S3, it's kind of the, the gateway drug to a distributed cluster because that's a pretty Something's good way to operate on the data. It's, it's, it's a pretty good architecture. That's where a lot of these um, projects are going these days. So yeah, let's talk about speed. We can we can actually speed through these slides. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, <laughs> back to our back to our data funnel. Uh, Parquet just helps uh, helps us do broad strokes um, and just back to hey you you don't have to just apply the funnel once. Do it again and again um, as much as you can. So, so filter out as much data at the beginning as possible. And something like Hive partitioning helps with that. Basically, it's just a fancy way to name your files and organize your files so that uh, your query can look at the paths that your file is stored at and be like, oh, this path only contains data for this month. And your query wants 
something three months ago. Like I don't have to look at anything under that path. That's essentially hive partitioning. Uh, so, so limiting the time range is a good thing. Like, yeah, if you've got data back to three years or whatever, you probably don't always need to query all of it. Uh, decide, you know, what's what's most relevant to you, and to focus on that time range. And we we did this earlier with um, writing our results out to a, a a temporary file on the command line, but caching caching results into a smaller data set. So like you you decide, okay, this is the subset of data that I want, but I don't necessarily know what all I want to do with it. So grab grab that subset of data, store it somewhere, and now you've got a much smaller set of data to work with, and you can do experiments much faster that way. Which is sometimes behind the scenes what's happening in your sim, right? You just don't know that. Yeah, 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 totally. Caching, uh, especially if you're running the same query over and over again, mm -hmm. chances are the, the sim might be caching those results for a little bit. Uh, OK, so lazy evaluation is pretty cool, um, honestly. So the some of the technologies we had on our previous slides Spark and I think pandas can do it now. Polars can do it. Basically, if you line out, hey, this is this is my data pipeline. Um, I, this is this is everything I want to go from like ingest to this is my result. Instead of executing it like one by one, uh, like you might do from the command line, say I want I want I'm going to run this command and then this command. Um, if you, if the query if a query optimizer like in a database can see your whole command, your whole query, your, your whole pipeline at once, it can say, oh, I see that at the beginning, he's selecting all the fields and say, like, you know, he wants all the fields because obviously doesn't know what, what he's going to end up with or he, what he or she is going to end up with. But at the end and in the middle, he only uses these three or four fields. Uh, so the query optimizer can actually go back to the beginning step and only pull the fields that are actually used from uh, from the data in the first place. And it, it, there's a bunch of things that it can optimize away like that. Um, say you do two steps that make sense for you to think through, but they aren't the most efficient way for it to execute. The, a lot of query optimizers can detect things like that and combine them into a, a more efficient way. So you get readable steps and queries, but yet it's not inefficient like you wrote it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that lazy evaluation and, uh, and caching thing is basically how the big data internet works now, like yeah. with PySpark yeah. and Spark type stuff. So we ended up having to, to solve for scale uh, for Zeek data and, and our. Um, in our SOC. And, and, and the reason why is because, you know, you have 10, 20, 30, 40 sensors, and they're all not part of the same cluster. Like, it's, it's very difficult for analysts to kind of keep that straight, right? Like, well, okay, I need to, this customer go to these couple of sensors and look. And, and so basically, what we ended up doing uh, was treating Ansible to run uh, THT scripts across all of our sensors and then bring back the log data, which is is perfectly fine, um, but still Works. might have scaling <laughs> issues. And it is a Rube Goldberg machine of, of uh, not to take anything away from the whole thing. I mean, it is, it's how we solve for it at one point, right? And still what we kind of do now, but you know, I'll, I'll let Ethan talk about what we want to do looking forward because I don't want to misspeak on, oh, on no. that. Right. <laughs> yeah, so so we still we still use the the duct tape popsicle stick sticks ansible. Well, all you know, of it is it, duct tape and popsicle like, sticks. We, yeah, yeah. We <laughs> we have the uh, series like you saw the screenshot earlier, like 42 droplets just sitting there. We might as well use them as kind of a poor man's cluster. So uh, but the other the other things that we're looking for is so I, I really like ClickHouse. I've been playing with that a lot lately. So it's um it's a columnar database, OLAP database. And so it's analytic for meant for analytical querying, and it just has a lot of efficiencies for the types of workloads that we are doing. So right now, like we're shipping all our data into a ClickHouse database, and Grafana has been a great tool for yeah, visualizing say, that data. What can we do with all this data? Yeah. Uh, so, so here's a couple of examples of things that we can pull out. So these are just 
summaries like we're playing around with dashboards and like what's what might be interesting so so this is really easy to detect visually um an ip range scan so you see the spikes there going up like that's how many distinct ips are being communicated with not not number of connections just distinct ips so that's you know someone's scanning a broad swath of of ips put and that's uh, that happens to be internal IPs. So it's probably an internal, either asset inventory system or um, a, a vulnerability scanner. So and then nifty to so, detect a port scan and all that data. Yeah, and uh, down in the bottom one is a same thing, but with a port scan. So you can see that the spike goes up to sixty five thousand five hundred thirty five, and that's that's all the ports. Like someone's scanning all the ports. Um, a smaller spike would be like, oh, maybe they're doing a thousand port scan or whatever, but uh, that's that's what they look for, look look like. Um, you can do fancier yep. things too, like producer-consumer yeah. relationships or producer-consumer ratio. So what, real quick, we have two minutes, right? We're not even going to yep. get to the bonus slides. Well, maybe- That's we why they're in the slide deck for people to download. Uh, so uh, real quick, PCR ratio, you're basically calculating a ratio of bytes sent versus bytes received. There's the, the algorithm for it. It's pretty simple. And the idea being is that you're trying to look for a fluctuation in the ratio where one is a pure push from a host or an upload and a negative one is a pure download. And so um, you know, you're just downloading stuff, normal user behavior. You might not, you know, be able, you, you won't, you know, get uh like the the spikes that we see here based on the ratio yeah so these graphs take a little there's a, there's a little more going on but basically uh yellow and green lines which are kind of hard to tell apart but they're the solid lines here are bytes in and bytes out so sent and received and then the blue line is the pcr ratio the the blue dotted line uh so the the blue line when it goes up means that there's an upload happening but like it's a the ratio is, it's a pure push. Like there's not a whole lot of corresponding download happening. And if it goes down, that means there's a download happening. There's not a whole lot of bytes being sent upload wise. So the first graph is an example of, hey, there's a spike in data. I wonder if it means data exfiltration, but if you uh, enrich that data with the PCR and you see that PCR is kind of flat, like, no, they're both, they're both uh, increasing lockstep or like in, in the same ratio. So the PCR stays flat and it's a good way to tell, you know, that it's, it's, not, it's not really concerning. Versus the bottom graph, we've got a spike and it's also combined with a shift from the PCR of from download to upload. So this could be data exfiltration. And in this case, I'd wanna like widen out the view and see is this pattern common um, in this organization, or is this something that we need to look at? Window out to view. So I think we made it right at two o'clock uh, for the conclusion. And, and someone asked if we would, if we had, if we could talk about log file analysis for an hour. And I, I chuckled and said we could probably go for <laughs> quite a while, actually. And so I, you know, I, I personally think that you know the fundamental stuff that we showed at the beginning is probably these are skill sets that you know we should work every. Every security practitioner should be able, at least familiar with what can happen at the command line. And if you're doing the, that type of work, like the command line is kind of where you start. And then as you move forward, um, well, you might have more bigger problems to solve. So one, yeah, we are right at two o'clock. And generally what we do uh, at this point is we would go to Q&A. Unfortunately, one, we ran out of time. And two, uh, the fine folks here uh, unfortunately have a hard stop. So what I've done is over in a notepad here, both in uh, Ethan and Derek, um, I've got all the questions. I'm going to dump them into a single discord post and you guys can kind of cherry pick out uh, the responses and things like that uh, as you have time throughout the day. So if you did have questions that don't get into there, please go into webcast and live chat and the BHS webcast and, and ping these folks, Derek and Ethan, what are your, uh, what are your, what are your discord names so that uh, folks can tag you i mean uh, hack. mine is d-e-r-u-k-e -E, daruk daruk which if you're at wild west hacking fest i'll tell you the the story that's the genesis of that okay anybody cares and ethan i'm ethac 
I just posted. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. So with that said, <laughs> uh, with that said, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, Ethan and Derek, thank you for sharing all this knowledge. Like you said, there's bonus slides in there as well. So if you go into slide resources, definitely check that out. I know many of you have got to end your lunch break or, or get to other meetings. So thank you for joining us for another Black Hills Information Security webcast. We do webcasts on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So check us out next week for another anti-siphon anti-cast or another Black Hills Information Security webcast. And also Come out and hang out with us at Wild West Hack and Fest. We got these folks doing some training. We got other folks doing some training, and we would love to see you. But if you don't register soon, it's selling out. So please go to www.wildwesthackandfest.com and check that out. With that said, the 623 of you still hanging on, the diehards, thank you so much. Man, 623 people that like log file analysis as much as we do, Ethan. I just, I don't... Remember, remember our disclaimer from the beginning not responsible for any data addictions. And thank you very much for coming and listening to us talk about that. Yes, absolutely. This has been fun. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's, so, it's humbling how many people are interested. <laughs> yeah, so uh, one, yes, thank you for doing it. And for myself, uh, Hal, uh, Brian, Dale, Ashley, Ryan, Troy, uh, I think Kyle dropped off. I'm sure I'm missing a few that still aren't on. <laughs> of course, Ethan and Derek, thank you for joining us on another webcast. Ryan, would you please consume it with uh, flames? <laughs>